Born in London in 86, a stash show gent named Richard Parliament. He loves to wrestle, but he loves one more thing, and goes round the world. He fights in his comments and he argues with fans. It's a problem no one understands. If there's two things he loves, it's getting at, and goes round the world. Drinking fine wine, fighting fanboys, handhelds round the world. Top Hat Gaming Man. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here, welcoming you back to another exciting, informative and fact-filled episode of Handhelds Around the World. Today I find myself in Lisbon, the capital of and largest city in Portugal. Lisbon is actually one of the oldest cities in the entire world and just so happens to be the second oldest capital city in Europe after Athens, which is in Greece if you somehow didn't already know that. After the eventual fall of the once mighty Roman Empire, Lisbon was ruled by a series of Germanic tribes before being captured by the Moors in the 8th century. The city was eventually conquered in 1147 by Alfonso Enriquez, who became the first king of Portugal, achieving independence for the nation and transitioned Lisbon into the political, cultural and economic centre of the country we know and love today. Bloody good show! As beautiful, historically rich and culturally bountiful as this city is, it just wouldn't be the same without some lovely shiny handhelds to keep me company and keep me entertained when I'm not admiring the Bellum Tower. And this time out, I've been playing the Game Gear exclusive Golden Axe title that has a massive identity crisis. While we have already looked at Golden Axe games on this channel that seem to think the franchise should be a fighting game one like Samurai Showdown or a top-down action RPG like The Legend of Zelda, in today's case though we are going to be looking at the Golden Axe game that ludicrously thought it was Zelda 2. Perhaps the most preposterous new direction for the franchise of all time. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Axe Battler, a legend of Golden Axe. Yeah! Sega's first and only real foray into the dedicated handheld gaming market, the Game Gear, really had its work cut out for it right from the off, having to compete directly with Nintendo's ridiculously popular and absurdly long-lasting little brick of neon green gaming goodness, the Game Boy. Released in October 1990 in Japan, April 1991 in North America and Europe, and 1992 in Australia, Sega's Game Gear was lauded for its technologically advanced full-colour and backlit screen, which was intended to make Nintendo's monochrome Game Boy seem almost obsolete in comparison. The Game Gear did enjoy some initial success as a result of this, but ultimately many factors such as a high price point, shoddy battery life and a lack of popular games meant it could never get enough momentum to get a real foothold on the market. The real issue, however, was the fact that it was going against a merciless monochrome monster that would not die, the supposedly technologically obsolete Game Boy, which continued to outsell the Game Gear at every turn. Still, despite jobbing out badly to Nintendo's little AA battery-powered killing machine, it's not like the Game Gear didn't have some memorable titles. And one of the most notable for a variety of reasons is 1991's Axe Battler, A Legend of Golden Axe. We've talked quite a bit about the Golden Axe franchise on this channel in the past, so there's no need to go into too much detail here. But briefly, Golden Axe was an extremely popular and influential side-scrolling brawler, employing a fantasy setting loosely inspired by things like Willow and Lord of the Rings, but more specifically, and directly, the Conan the Barbarian series of films. Designed by Alter Beast creator Makoto Uchida on the Sega System 16B arcade hardware, Golden Axe was a massive success and became one of the most recognisable franchises of the late 80s and early 90s, and inevitably spawned a ridiculous amount of ports and a not too insignificant amount of both sequels and spin-offs. The direct sequel Golden Axe 2 and the arcade exclusive Golden Axe The Revenge of Death Adder are both widely regarded and fondly remembered, but most of the other games in the franchise are often overlooked or forgotten completely. Incidentally, despite The Revenge of Death Adder being one of Sega's most beloved and critically acclaimed beat-em-ups of the time, it failed to get any kind of home port on anything whatsoever, until it appeared on Sega's Astro City Mini small-scale home arcade cabinet in 2020, a full 28 years after its original release. 
Classic zany Sega decision making, eh? Anyway, one of those aforementioned all but forgotten titles is this curious little Game Gear exclusive Axe Battler, made even more curious by the fact it bears both a strong resemblance to and shares several things in common with Nintendo's divisive but well-loved 1987 hit Zelda 2 The Adventures of Link. As we have discussed in a dedicated video elsewhere on this channel, 1991 Sega Master System exclusive Golden Axe Warrior was a massive departure for the Golden Axe series, venturing into early console style adventure RPG territory, and is actually something of a shameless Legend of Zelda clone. With Axe Battler being a kind of spiritual sequel to Golden Axe Warrior, unbelievably the shameless plagiarists over at Sega decided to take the already pretty bloody obvious Zelda influence and take it one step further by making their sequel a clone of the Zelda sequel. And they thought we wouldn't even notice the swines. I'm on to you Sega. You have to get up a lot bloody earlier in the mornings to outwit Big Daddy Detective Top Hat. Yeah. While Golden Axe Warrior deployed a top-down semi-open world, Axe Battler mixed things up with a top-down map area, with towns to enter and NPCs to, side-scrolling action stages for the dungeons and random battle encounters. Does this all sound familiar? Published by Sega but developed by Aspect Co, the game itself is really quite an ambitious one, especially considering how early into the Game Gear's life it was released, and the limitations of the stripped down 8-bit hardware it was being programmed for. The visuals are bright and detailed with an appealing range of colours and are easy to make out on the tiny little low red screen. There weren't many examples of this type of experience on the go at this point in history, so despite its flaws, which we'll get to shortly, it could definitely be considered ahead of its time in a lot of ways. Players control the titular Axe Battler, who was always the poster boy and main draw of the original arcade games. As I alluded to earlier, the Golden Axe series is heavily inspired by Conan the Barbarian, and the game massively capitalised on the popularity of that movie franchise at the time, with its main character who is basically Arnold Schwarzenegger playing Conan in pixel form. His name is a little confusing however, as being called Axe Battler, it would probably be reasonable to expect a certain amount of battling to be done with, well, an axe. But on this occasion, our plucky protagonist is bucking the trend and saying be damned with convention, and will be predominantly using a sword instead. Basically, his stupid name alludes to the fact that he battles people who wield axes, rather than wielding one himself. Ludicrous, eh? In this spin-off adventure, our pal Axe has been called into action by the King of Firewood Castle as his mightiest warrior to take down returning series antagonist, the evil Death Adder, who has only gone and stolen the actual bloody golden axe from Firewood Castle again. Being that Death Adder is an absolute evil git of epic proportions, he plans to use the Golden Axe's immense power for nefarious means like world domination, tax evasion and kicking over old grannies but mostly world domination. It's up to the player to take control of Mr. Battler as you guide him through various locations en route to taking down this dastardly Death Adder fellow. Probably the most infuriating thing about the game, and also the number one reason for people stopping playing, is just how frequently the random encounters occur. You can't see the enemies before the battle start and there really isn't much of a warning whatsoever, so they basically come completely out of nowhere and happen far too often than is decent. You'll need to engage in quite a few of these battles if you want to collect enough magic vases, which serve as the game's currency to buy anything decent. But the fact that they occur constantly when you're just trying to get from point A to point B can be a right pain in the death adders. You will take on a surprisingly wide variety of foes in these battles that play out almost like one-on-one -on -one fighting game stages. You have to be extremely careful however, as despite you and your opponent both having life bars, taking one hit will kick you out of the battle with no reward. But you still have to whittle down your opponent's entire life bar to do away with them and get those all-important and ever-elusive magic vases. Although this is an interesting mechanic and adds a layer of difficulty and strategy to the game, it's also clear that the developers put it in to pad out the length of the playtime at the expense of any extra content. A cynical ploy indeed, but unfortunately one that was rife within the video game industry at the time. 
It was such a common practice that you could probably make the argument that it was just an accepted part of game development. As well as serving as currency, the magic vases can be used to power up magical attacks in the side-scrolling portions of the game, with the more vases being used resulting in a more powerful magic attack, much like the way the collectible blue magic vases are used in the original Golden Axe games. Although the battle encounters start off simple and the first wave of enemies can be dispatched pretty easily with some classic kid brother move spamming and button mashing, the foes quickly become more aggressive and cunning and you have to learn their attack patterns and specific techniques to kill them. If you're not familiar with their attacks, they'll overwhelm you and if you're not concentrating, they'll send you packing with one hit. So there you go, Axe Battler was Dark Souls 20 years before Dark Souls was Dark Souls, sort of. Often times when entering new areas you'll be facing off with palette swaps of previous enemies that have been given completely new attack patterns, making them feel like totally new enemies. And it's a bit like when the WWE repackages one of their brightest prospects by putting a silly hat on him and calling him Butch. Voila, new character entirely. In fairness, this was pretty common practice for RPGs back then and it's not even that uncommon today, so I can't really complain. Although the Zelda 2 comparisons are impossible to ignore, the side-scrolling dungeon type stages in Axe Battler play a lot more like Axe Razor, or possibly one of the Rastan games, with a beefier sprite behaving in a more controlled but sluggish way, compared to the fast and responsive movements of Link. Unfortunately, the limitations of both the Game Gear's CPU and the small screen are big issues here, as the action could be generously described as slightly choppy, or harshly described as a glorified slideshow. The large sprites on the almost microscopic screen are a godsend in terms of being able to make them out, but it means your field of view is frequently less than optimum and all too often you can't see far enough ahead or above you to either navigate the level or avoid the enemies or the projectiles they're selfishly lobbing at you. The scrolling can also be similarly problematic, with it being much too easy to find yourself way too far towards the right of the screen, almost completely at the mercy of whatever enemy pops up, given that you're almost certain not to see them in time. For this reason, Axe Battler really rewards careful methodical play and you'll probably find your best chance of consistent success is gradually inching yourself slowly forward, rather than ploughing ahead as if you're playing Metal Slug. Navigating the world of Axe Battler is a relatively easy one as most objectives only require a simple straightforward route to traverse and the map is comparatively small next to some similar home console games. You won't find any cryptic nonsense or mysterious confusing dialogue or instructions here, as everything is laid out in a refreshingly easy to understand way. At least when compared to a lot of weird, convoluted and often bizarrely arbitrary seeming things that many other games of the era had you doing. And yes, I reckon we're probably all thinking of Simon's quest right now. Between the main quests, you'll find yourself at various villages where you can have some good old chit chat with the local NPCs, as well as fill up your health, get passwords and learn new attack moves and abilities to help you with your quest. The training portion of these village visits is particularly important in learning enemy patterns, as you are given clones to practice your best moves against in a safe environment. Axe Battler isn't a particularly long game and skilled players that already have the patterns of the trickier enemies down could probably blast through the whole thing in little more than an hour. The amount of trial and error involved however means you're highly unlikely to get through it anything like that quickly on a first playthrough. As an all-round game, Axe Battler does hold a significant amount of historical importance, so it's definitely worth a look at for gaming historians. But overall, the clunky controls, frustrating gameplay, poor hit detection and lack of polish make it a far cry from the rewarding experience of its arcade beat-em-up cousins. Or its Hyrule-based Nintendo counterparts either. Despite this, Axe Battler does have a certain charm that elevates it beyond its flaws and underdeveloped elements. A quirky oddity for sure, and not one that you're likely to be fawning over or going back to frequently, but one that is sure to produce the old wry smile here and there. That about wraps it up for this look at the history of Axe Battler and this episode of Handhelds Around the World. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the Golden Axe game that couldn't decide what it wanted to be. 
leave it in the comments below if you have any experiences of this particular game or if there's any titles, handhelds or franchises you'd like to see me cover in future episodes. I am now inches away from having covered every single Golden Axe game ever made on this channel, with only this entry in the series left to get through. <laughs> I have to say I really enjoyed this brief visit to Portugal and cannot wait to explore more great nations on this channel in the future. Handheld gaming in unique locations has been part of this channel's identity for a long time, so be sure to check out my Handhelds Around the World playlist to see where else I have been on my adventures. You've all heard of the adventures of Link, it's time to experience the adventures of Top Hat. Special shout outs go out to channel backers such as A Murder of Crows, Carl Johnson, Heo Paula Lopez, Nostalgia Collector, Ben Harrodine, Corey I. Marsh Sr., Ron Dinch, Evan Border, Philip Manth, Azure Archive, Jockin Varela, Michael Cullix, Ego, Jordan Duran, Ian Boyle, Nick Daniels, Princess Zana, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of the Ted, Gary Pinkett, EC Professor, Johnny Holly, Ugas Piazza, Justin Wang, Capcom vs SNK, Hermes Gonzalez, Man Shovel, Michael Hall, Sang He, Norma Stitz, Langston Miller, Noob, Sarah Powell, Vlaming Rene, Marvin Liga, TOG Driver, Luis Fiant, John Bates, David Bow, Chris Fisk, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Synth Spaces, Punk Toast, and everybody else who backs my work over on the Patreon platform. Long live Portugal, long live Western Europe, long live democracy. Yeah, you know what I'm getting at. Uh.